HRN listeners. As we celebrate our 15th year, we are deepening our commitment to giving voice to the next generation of food system storytellers, and we need your help. Our internship and fellowship programs help activate new possibilities for underrepresented and underestimated young people through experiential journalism, audio engineering, and production training. Through these unique programs, HRN helps food equity stewards build essential workforce readiness skills that expand their potential and foster economic mobility. Please consider supporting these critical programs. And with a minimum donation, you can be entered to win a dinner for two at an amazing restaurant in one of eight cities and tickets to a concert at a great venue in one of those cities. We have incredible partners across the country who have donated as they also share our passion for helping to educate the next generation of food system storytellers. Check out heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. That's heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. And make sure you donate before March 31st. Thank you. Hello, this is Dana Cowan, and you are listening to Heritage On Tour on Heritage Radio Network. You might know me as the host of Speaking Broadly, but today I'm recording in the town of Toyama in Japan, not in the shipping container in Brooklyn. Toyama is a relatively unassuming city that's about two hours by bullet train from Tokyo. It is not the most architecturally distinguished place. It's kind of gray with a lot of modern buildings, but what it lacks in architectural beauty, it absolutely makes up in ingredients and culinary pride. So I went to see what a new generation of chefs was making and was completely blown away by the sophistication and the passion. I was accompanied on my trip by Shima Fuzu, who acted as my guide and translator. Shima, welcome to Heritage on Tour. Hi, Dana. So, can you help me situate listeners? Like, where is Toyama? I mean, I know I said that it was on a bullet train, uh, or two hours away on a bullet train, but what is so magnetic about this area for chefs? So, first of all, it is a bay, Toyama Bay, that's located between the Sea of Japan and a very high range of steep mountains, which means it's an ideal location uh, that provides great seafood, great vegetables, and also meat. So it has some very unique seafood, such as the glowing squids, which you can only find there. I love that. So um, I've seen these little squids. Uh, they're pretty small, they're the size of your pinky, mm -hmm. and they're completely intact. They have heads, and you call them ears, um, but they're, they're, I don't know what they are exactly. They're sort right, of flippers. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, um, and then legs, yeah. and they're pretty small. And they, they must glow in the water, because on your plate they don't glow, right? Exactly. Okay. They, they glow like a blue neon in the sea. It's quite wow. spectacular in the night. Yeah. And then there's those, um, the little white shrimp that were everywhere. I mean, they were dried and raw and fried. And, I mean, you couldn't really go a step without meeting a white shrimp. Exactly. And the reason why these shrimp are so special, the shiroebi white shrimps, is because they are really uh, sweet and their, their taste is even sweeter than the amaebi, you know, the sweet shrimp that you often have in sushi restaurants. Yeah, I, I love ama. That's my one of my very favorite things to order. So we went to visit uh, Fuji'i, which is a restaurant in a somewhat unpromising location for a chef who is preaching the gospel of nature. Uh, you know, we arrived and there was that gas station across the street and then a big pharmacy mm -hmm. and then the place <laughs> itself there was no windows it was just a right. bunch of wood panels and very old weathered wood yeah. panels and I thought okay well I mean I know I've had great food in a strip mall and this is kind of <laughs> bordering on that and so we passed through that doorway which had what was it called the thing that hangs over the door the, uh, the it looks like uh, broomsticks Yes, and it's to welcome the customers, but also to bring good luck and prosperity to the restaurant. Oh, right, because there's an orange hanging in a little net that right. was also up there. So we walked under the orange and we experienced some prosperity. And then we <laughs> stepped on some wet stones because they purified. Yes, the... they purified the, the entrance to welcome you, to welcome the customers. And so 
I felt purified. It could have got me away from the gas station. And then we went into this very small dining room that's overseen by a purple dragon that is breaking out of the frame of the picture. And what does the dragon represent? So dragon, as you know, is an animal that doesn't exist, but uh, it's always represented as an, uh, going upwards towards the sky. So it's a simple symbol of um, elevating, elevation. Hmm. And this is why uh, he decided to put that painting there, because he was born a year of the dragon, and also for that symbol of, of always elevating himself. Elevating himself and also the, um, the ingredients of Toyama. Exactly. Because he is he is a booster of his neighborhood, his location, more than you know most people. Although we met a lot of chefs who care a lot about yeah. Toyama. Right. So, how would you describe um, Chef Hironori Fuji's food? So, as he was trained in uh, finest restaurants, starred restaurant in Kyoto and Kanazawa in the traditional way of Japanese cuisine, uh, quite refined style of cuisine. So I would say that this is his basis, but also honoring his uh, local uh, seasonal produce ingredients is uh, the most important thing for him. But he does it also uh, using some uh, modern techniques and also innovating recipes when he feels um, it would bring something, adding something more uh, of a contemporary touch. Actually, I loved uh, on our first plate, there were many, many elements, but there was one which was a, a fish cake that was a little bit sweet. What was the inspiration for that? So when you go to a sushi restaurant, at the end of the course, they would give you a kind of sweet omelette. Mm -hmm. And so from that we call gyoku, and he said that was his inspiration. And also he thought about the uh, pound cake we have called castera. So he said that it would bring a nice contrast in this first dish where you have several kinds of taste mixed together. You have sour, bitter, salty. And then to bring a touch of sweetness, uh, he created this new recipe and included it. I think that's great because... The Having eaten a lot of um, really wonderful Japanese food, there isn't, there aren't that many chefs who are breaking with tradition. And yeah. like within that first bite, I was like, "Ooh, this is this is sweet and very tasty." Right. Um, but much of what he is cooking at the restaurant is really a tribute to the waters of Toyama um, and waters both from the mountains and uh, the sea. From the sea, he gets these magnificent fish that he he treats spectacularly well. Like he goes to the dock and gets them live, and he right. he drives them home in his home to his restaurant in the van. Mm -hmm. And then when I was trying to figure out how to get into that rather uh -huh. <laughs> the closed looking restaurant, I discovered his fish tanks in the uh -huh. back. So there were these blue plastic tubs mm -hmm. um, where he brings the fish, and then he won't even kill the fish until what he believes is the perfect number of hours before they're to be served. And why is that? Like, why is there the perfect time to kill the fish? So he mentioned that the texture of the fish was so important, so you have to calculate backwards uh, in order to provide the best te textures to the customers. And so uh, that was for the porgy that we had, because yeah. we had porgy sashimi. But then, you know, he had told us the whole story about the six hours, and then he was literally standing in front of his board and there was a live really beautiful big squid like right. 10 times the uh -huh. size of the neon blue tiny ones, ones yeah. the tiny ones um and so he took his sushi knife as he was talking to us and just split it down the center and then cleaned the outside and the inside mm -hmm. and then scored it i don't know if there's a name for that the way he was doing millions of little cuts um, to make the flesh, um, I think, less chewy, yes. and then cut it into little strips, and then serve it to us uh, on a shiso leaf. Right. Um, so I guess there's different ways to serve the fish live. That's for the from the water, that's how he treats the fish, but there's also the water that he gets from the mountain spring. Um, so can you tell me about the spring? Yes, yeah, so as I said earlier, you have these high mountains uh, right next to Toyama where you have 
many springs providing different types of water. You have harder waters, softer waters. So Chef Fuji thinks that the milder water is the best for the dashi. So he drives up the mountain twice a week with his water tanks. <laughs> This is amazing. That he has to go get his own water. Exactly. And does he pay for it or it's free? Or? So it's free, but it's uh, located on the sacred grounds because we have the god of the water, of course, that we honor. So first he goes pray to the altar. Then he puts some money in the box of the shrine. And then he goes fill his water tanks. <laughs> so, okay, well, we're kind of drink, we're drinking dashi with holy water, from exactly. what it sounds like. Exactly. Uh, so the, the dashi watched him shave the bonito, right. which honestly looked like a wood foot. Uh -huh. You know, it's like, <laughs> it's such a hard form. And he, he shaved that in front of us. And then he showed us a kelp, which I don't know, it must have been, it's a dried and was five feet long with sort of spiky edges. Uh -huh. And so he creates this beautiful dashi from those two things. Yes. And he created one of my favorite courses, which was this dashi and then a pea and arrowroot um, jelly cake. Yes. And on top of that uh, were these pink crab legs that are nothing like the fake crab legs at all. First of all, they're real. Uh -huh. And um, the two of those together, the crab and the pea, were the essence of spring. And then the dashi and scallion, mm -hmm. it was a perfect um, light broth. Yeah. I thought it was phenomenal. Um, so we also learned from uh, the chef that The chefs in this area are mm -hmm. really supportive of each other. And mm -hmm. he had a word for that. What, what was the word? Sesatakuma, which means that uh, you they help each other and they yeah. rise together and they grow together. So the, they said that um, they actually they take trips to Tokyo together. They yeah. travel together. They get inspiration from one another. I mean, I loved uh, Chef Fuji's dish that was pastry shells that he filled with butter burr and miso yes. oh. and um so these pastry shells are sort of shaped like a flat peanut or a mm -hmm. lozenge and he heats them so they're a little grilled and he they're usually used for to be filled with like pastry cream or something but his friend who uh, cooks in a French restaurant use them in a savory way. So mm -hmm. he used them in a savory way. I just like, I love that tiny example of the exchange. Yeah. Um, so at the end of our meal, and we were saying that we were going to be staying in town, he, he picked up the phone and um, got us a reservation that apparently is an incredibly hard reservation to get mm -hmm. at um, a place called Himawari Shakudo. Mm -hmm. um, so what is the translation of that restaurant name? It means a uh, sunflower uh, restaurant. Huh. And so that, that chef's name was Hozumi Tanaka. Uh -huh. And was he from Toyama? Because Chef Fuji, Fuji is from Toyama. Uh -huh. As well as uh, Chef Tanaka. So he, re he returned after traveling through Italy for, for four years. Right. Um, so I was really excited to get to go to that restaurant. I felt like I was being passed from chef to chef. Uh, so when we when we got there, it was quite late because, of course, to get a last minute reservation, it had to be um, quite late. And I walked in, and I actually felt a little bit of Italy. The, mm -hmm. the floors were concrete. Mm -hmm. The kitchen was more modern than yeah. the other kitchens that I've seen. And um, Then we passed into this small dining room, and it had this modern touch at the back, which was it, it had um, a plywood wall, and uh, the the facing wall had a lineup of grappas, and then there was a box of sasakaya, wh mm -hmm. where you would ship sasakaya, which is an incredible super Tuscan wine. So I felt like it was all coming together. I was having a little experience mm -hmm. of of Italy there. Um, My favorite dish uh -huh. was a linguine with a coriander sauce with this beautiful squid. So he was clearly riffing on a, a pesto, mm -hmm. except coriander was the green. And then there's a beautiful leaf of coriander mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to like ground um, 
coriander. Mm-hmm. And um, it was a very light and fragrant dish. Yeah, it was wonderful. I know, you liked it too. I, that might have been your favorite, but if that wasn't your favorite, <laughs> what would be your next favorite dish? Well, I love the Toyama beefsteak that we had. Mm. That was outstanding. So tender and tasty. Although I was full, I had to finish it. I couldn't stop. <laughs> I so had, it's also a local beef that was really delicious. So that's, where do those cattle graze? I mean, are they in the mountains In somewhere? the mountains nearby, yeah. So, that reminded me of um, an Italian butcher, Dario Ciccini. Like the beef, the beef was so perfectly seared and and juicy and tender. And um, I agree, it was really delicious. And I was so full by that time because mm-hmm. we'd had many many courses at lunch and then many many courses at dinner. And I wasn't expecting the beef, but I kind of had to finish it. Yeah. <laughs> so another great friend of both. Um, Hironori Fujii and Hazumi Tanaka is Aisha, I don't know if that's how you pronounce it, um, Tanaguchi yes. at Levo. Mm-hmm. His restaurant is about 40 minutes in, out in the countryside in a hotel with a spa. Actually, most of the people we saw were wearing like pink robes or black robes and slippers, and yeah, they were not there for very lunch. Very relaxed. <laughs> they were very relaxed. <laughs> um, so we're going to take a quick break right now, and when we come back, we're going to talk a little bit, bit about Alivo. Hey, this is Katie Mosman Wadler. I'm the executive director of Heritage Radio Network, and I wanted to say thanks for listening to the only pizza-powered radio station in the entire world. For a decade, HRN has broadcast live from two shipping containers inside Roberta's Pizza in Bushwick, Brooklyn, telling the most entertaining and educational stories about food and drink across 35-plus weekly shows. HRN has made it this far thanks to the support of listeners like you. If you like what you hear, show us some love by going to heritageradionetwork.org slash donate. With your help, HRN will be able to keep the lights on, the mic's hot, and the pizza coming for the next 10 years of food radio. Welcome back. You are listening to Dana Cowan at on Heritage on Tour. And I am in Japan today, not in a container in Brooklyn. So uh, my guest today is Shima Puzu, and we're talking about uh, Toyama and three incredible chefs who are cooking there, each with a very different point of view. One is... Uh, pretty strictly Japanese, one is Italian influenced, and the last is French influenced. So, Ashima Levo is a restaurant of some renown, yes? Yes, because this is a young, uh, ambitious chef offering very unique original cuisine, and he got a Michelin star, and he was awarded the Goemio Prize, the first one that was awarded in Japan in 2017 when they started. Wow. And Levo is a shorthand for evolution, I guess. Evolution, yeah. Because this is a chef who keeps seeking for new ways of cooking and presenting also his dishes. Right. So he started out, um, well, actually, his parents owned a tonkatsu Mm -hmm. restaurant in Osaka. And uh, he's gone quite far from there because he ended up cooking a Western style and embracing exactly. French tradition, yeah. and he keeps going. So he's now, he uses French technique, but has pushed um, his thoughts on food even further because he's mm-hmm. really married the French tradition with uh, the countryside, mm-hmm. the Toyama countryside. So because his restaurant is set in the mountains, it actually makes a whole lot of sense mm-hmm. that his menu has a lot more meat because a lot of yeah, the other... we had a lot of meat. We yeah. had a lot of meat. <laughs> We've otherwise been having a lot of fish here. But um, so we were, we, you were reading through the menu and telling me course by course, uh-huh. and you said that there was bear on the menu, uh-huh. and that really scared me. I wasn't sure I was really up for bear. Exactly, because badger in Japanese, when you write it, it means cave bear. So I imagine a huge bear coming out from this cave. <laughs> but it turned out that it was actually a little badger. So you Googled it, and then you showed me this picture of a badger. I'm like, I don't think I really want to see the picture of the badger and then eat the badger. But um, but that's exactly what we did. So the badger was prepared in a shabu shabu style, which means what exactly? Shabu shabu means you pass it quickly under hot water just to color it. 
And then the chef put it in a broth that was made out of, out of the badger uh, broth and the pheasant broth combined together. And it, that was really special, as you remember. I do. So the, the badger meat, it, at first I looked at it and I thought, it actually looks a little bit like prosciutto because it mm-hmm. has a wide ribbon of fat right. and then a pink sort of ribbon Mm -hmm. of um, meat. Mm -hmm. And I asked optimistically whether it had been aged, hoping that it had been cooked, because I really (laughs) didn't want to be eating raw badger. (laughs) But as you say, shabu shabu, it passes lightly Uh through this boiling or very hot water. Um, And so there it was in the broth, and it wasn't bare, and I was going to have to eat badger for the first time. Un- under the badger were these slivers of scallions. Yeah. And so thinking of negamaki, which is mm-hmm. um, beef wrapped around scallions. Mm-hmm. So I took the um, these the slices of badger and wrapped them around the scallions mm-hmm. and just popped them in my mouth. And actually, it wasn't gamey at all. Mm-hmm. It was really mild. And instead of being really chewy and tough, which I'm like a badger, badgers mm-hmm. are supposed to be tough old animal, you know, tough animals, <laughs> but it was much less combative than your average steak uh-huh. or pork. That was great. What did you think? Yeah, and the taste was really mild, as you just said, and I think because of this fat, you know, they're really tasty and mild. Yeah. So the, um, I think he started serving badger because the hunter of the badger was a friend and said, mm-hmm. no, no, people around here eat badger yeah. all the time. <laughs> and he's like, okay. So um, is that right? Exactly. So he has a hunter friend who catches a bear, venison, badger, and uh, all the animals that his uh, hunter friend gets, Taniguchi chef, would uh, skin them, cut them out, and prepare them all by himself. That is amazing. So he's essentially a chef butcher. Mm-hmm. Like the, I just, I think that's so much work, but it also honors the animal, right? Yeah, exactly. You use every single piece uh-huh. of it, and you know, well, you really know where mm-hmm. your food comes from. And he, he said it was really important to separate the fat from the bones immediately after killing the, either the bear or the badger. Why was that? Yeah, especially for the bear and the badger. Uh, this is to prevent the fat from getting unwanted flavor. So you have to do it immediately after you kill them. Yeah, he said it was going to be bad. Mm -hmm. Well, so when we asked him what his next step was, you know, because he's continuing to evolve, he said he was going to evolve and go into the mountains where there was no electricity and no water. No water, yeah, that's incredible. I think it's really, that's extreme. But I, I feel like there's a lot of chefs in America today who are moving, you know, farther out of cities. Uh-huh. Uh, and they're also making retreats or restaurants that honor nature mm-hmm. uh, in this way. Or you think about um, a chef like Michel Brass, who, uh, you know, he's using all the nature around him too. Right. Now, he's not... I suppose he has electricity in <laughs> yes, <he> water. Yes, <laughs> but how much in the countryside is he? But he lives in a remote uh, region also. Th- this is why Michel Bras has to close his restaurant from October to March, because you have so much no- snow that the roads are closed. Mm. It's so, similar in that way. Well, this was a really great trip to Toyama. There are a couple of other chefs that these three chefs admire. Um, one who has a... Um, a tempura restaurant. Right. Do, do you know the name of that? Takano. Takano. And then there's one last restaurant that we didn't get to try, which was a sushi restaurant. And that was called... Sushi Jin. Okay. So if anyone wants to plan a trip to Toyama, don't go for the architecture, but do go for the food. <laughs> Thank you so much for listening to Heritage on Tour. This is Dana Cowan and reporting in from Japan. Have a great week.